rest are online. And uh, I'll straight away go to the point. Uh, my introductions have been made, so I go straight uh, to the introduction. We know very many people with disabilities do not have equal access to healthcare. But not only healthcare, but including education, especially the young learners and the employment opportunities. Now, evidence shows that this, their socioeconomic outcomes are affected and COVID-19 has made matters worse. Simple definitions of disability, I will not dwell so much. It is important to know that any limitation of activity or restriction in participation uh, is a, a fair definition, simple definition of disability. And uh, we must know that disability is looked at as a concept and it has evolved from a medical model to social model now to a human rights model. And the environment is an important factor. Uh, we should not look at disability as a matter of disease, but the environment in which that person lives. So environmental factors are very important. And it's also important to know that palliative care is specialized care for people living with serious illnesses. And it aims at provision of relief and reduction of stress. This is especially uh, very important from the fact that people with a disability for one cause or the other, as we shall see, uh, when they end up with in need of palliative care, they offer special challenges. Uh, I'm here I'm trying to show the areas according to the Washington group of questions, the areas that we look at uh, as a matter of uniformity throughout the world, and this is what we also use in Uganda. Difficulty in seeing, difficulty in hearing. Will I go back? I think it's okay. You can, you can go back and wait. <laughs> Sorry for that, Miss Up. Uh, those are my introductions, and they have been fairly given. And uh, I'd gone into introduction of uh, the topic disabilities. Uh, are very common in Uganda and all over the world, and they offer challenges in access to healthcare. And the matters are even made worse by COVID-19. And as a matter of definition, disability is looked at as any limitation in activity uh, or restriction in participation. And uh, the environment is an important factor because it offers challenges to the person with the disability. And uh, palliative care is looked at as a specialized care for people living with serious illnesses. And it aims at provision of relief and reduction of stress. Can you see my screen? Listeners, please. Yes, we are seeing it. Okay, thank you. In Uganda, we also adopted the Washington questions, uh, where we look at disability in relation to those questions, difficulty in seeing, difficulty in hearing, difficulty in walking, remembering or concentrating, and the difficulty in self-care, and the difficulty in language. And these are the questions and the areas of disability which we look at. Uh, I just want to say that 
There is a relationship between health and disabilities and palliative care, of course. Uh, whether a health condition interacts with contextual factors will result in disability is determined by interrelated factors. And these factors are very many, and I will not dwell so much in that. But it is important to know that if there are comorbidities, then you find multiple disability or a disability and some other long-standing illness, for example, non-communicable diseases. And in this case, now we all know the new pandemic, COVID, com comorbidities have actually done a lot of havoc and the and the mobility and mortality uh, has tended to be high. Am I, is my screen on? Yes, it's on. You just need to move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, what's right? What are you seeing right now? Uh, it's now in video mode. We are just seeing you guys where you are. <laughs> you stopped sharing the screen. Mm. Okay. Uh, we just need now to move to the current slide that he's presenting on. It's still on the topic slide. Our apologies to the participants will be sorted just now. Just a moment, please. What are you seeing, what's right? Yes, we are, we are seeing the screen now, but we, it's still the topic slide. Can you, are you able to scroll down to the current slide? Okay. Um, sorry, it's, it's just, are you on slide six now? Is this where you are? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, yes, let me. We are seeing it now. Okay, thank you. Uh, allow me to talk about the causes of disability and uh, I will be very brief. Some are infectious diseases, well known like polio, mumps, measles, uh, lymphatic filariasis, including HIV AIDS. Those are infectious, but we also now have now the non-communicable conditions such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, mental disorders, the cancers and respiratory illnesses. We have iatrogenic causes. These are caused by the health workers ourselves. And we also have age-related disability. And uh, we have disabilities, especially due to trauma, in conflict situations. In this country, Uganda, we had some war in the northern part of Uganda and it left a lot of injuries, either due to gunshot wounds, uh, but also due to bombs here and there. 
but we also it left a lot of stress and the mental uh, disability came in and uh, we also need to know that hearing loss caused in the places of work is not very uncommon. So the needs for services and assistance is enormous. People with disabilities may require a range of services, ranging from minor and inexpensive to complex and costly interventions. But we have challenges of data and I will elaborate uh, a little bit later. What is our mandate as a division? We derive our mandate from the Ministry of Health Mandate and Health Sector Development and Invest, uh, Investment Plan, and it includes policy formulation, standards and guidelines, planning, coordination, networking, and resource mobilization, which we are doing now with the Palliative Care Association of Uganda. We do supervise our rehabilitative healthcare workers. We do some bit of research. And uh, I want only to talk about among the many terminologies, only one, and that is the primary healthcare condition, which is the starting point for impairment. And this include this may include some of those diseases that we looked at above, but there are also secondary ones. And uh, I want to say that if you look at the comorbidity, comorbidity issues, COVID-19 has worsened the situation whereby you find an individual with one or two, that is multiple disability, but with another non-communicable disease, which may result in another disability or otherwise. So these are the challenges and it cannot be life as usual. These are the challenges we as health workers we are meeting. And the rehabilitation of course is described as a range of responses to disability from interventions to improve body functions to more comprehensive measures. And our rehab workers of different categories and professions are very good at that. And uh, of course, we need, we need to know that there is habilitation and rehabilitation, very related, but not exactly the same. And uh, rehabilitation I've already talked about is a set of those measures that will assist the person with the disability. Uh, or somebody who is likely to experience disability, uh, restoration of function. And it can be in form of medicine, in form of therapy, in form of assistive technologies, just in summary. We have barriers to offering services to rehabilitation and palliative care in our country. And this can be looked at uh, in many ways. And uh, I'm uh, now projecting how we can overcome some of them through policy reforms, laws, and other systems, including development or revision of national rehabilitation plans. And amid the COVID-19 pandemic, such a review should be cognizant of the persons and challenges, uh, the challenges the person with the disabilities face and the need for palliative care, especially in view of the fact that even before COVID-19 came in, the non-communicable diseases in our country is quite enormous with all those challenges. We, develop, we need to develop funding mechanisms because funding at various levels is a challenge, it's a barrier. Human resources, who are these people? The rehab healthcare workers, geriatricians who deal with old people conditions and palliative care personnel. They are still limited in this country and expanding service delivery. And of course, include, including use of affordable technology and assistive devices and essential medicines, which are used in palliative care. And uh, this is uh, and expanding research programs. Very little information is still known in this country about these conditions. And I think this can be better achieved through collaborative approaches that enhance synergies through gov government agencies NGOs, CBOs, and other uh, international organizations. We need to look at enhancing support again in deinstitutionalizing these services. They don't need to be only looked at. Example for palliative care, you, it involves going to the homes, reaching the person who is affected. If you continue thinking in the 
uh, old reasoning that you are going to deliver palliative care in an area where, for, for example, there is a health facility, then we are mistaken. So we need to look at that. Creating a framework for commissioning support services. Funding I've already talked about. Palliative care and rehab assessments are very vital and they are individual. Uh, they, they, you need to assess the individuals very well and set their goals. What about the new providers? We have talked about training them. They need regulation. And we can achieve much through public-private partnership, uh, including voluntary services. In this country, we have very health teams. They are doing a good job in voluntary services. And uh, building capacity, skilling, uh, will be a continue, should be a continuous process. I've talked about the environment uh, in, in, in terms of rehabilitation uh, for PWDs, but also palliative care. The environment is very important. And uh, I will not dare so much on that in view of the time. But allow me to give an example that accessibility for people with, for example, physical disabilities in form of, for example, ramps to reach their workplaces, to reach the schools is very important. But also accessibility at, uh, and the environment in terms of those with hearing impairment. For example, if you give them hearing aids, then you have actually done a good job for them. And including the devices for uh, uh, site restoration. I want to share with you some of the best practices that we have had. And I have decided to indicate two districts, Mukono and Shema, and they looked at aging as one of the main causes, major causes of disability. And they passed bylaws for health aging uh, to look at mitigating the effects of aging on disability and dementia. And uh, we have interacted with these districts. We have uh, uh, collaborated with them. This is done through regular camps, through promotion of early screening during those camps to detect those conditions. And then a lot of exercise that really works on their mental status, nutrition, promotion and education and counseling. And we need also to know that in this country, palliative care is allowed as an outreach, as a home-based care. And I want to mention some good news that the restructured Ministry of Health uh, actually provides for a whole division for palliative care and future posts at the lower units. They are yet to be filled, but the establishments are there. Partnerships do exist. We collaborate with Hospice Uganda, Palliative Association of Uganda, uh, uh, organizations like TASO, which at look, look at the area of HIV and, uh, and other private entities. And these collaborations as part of our mandate, you remember, are very important. And actually I am here presenting this in the name of collaboration. Uh, in the new non-communicable disease strategy, palliative care is well emphasized as a way to mitigate, to mitigate effects of diseases such as the ever increasing cancers, especially in the terminal stages, cardiovascular accidents, including stroke and health aging. What do we need to look at in terms of continuity of essential health services during this pandemic? Cognizant or aware of the fact that the COVID-19 poses risks of disrupting essential services. And this we know is caused by some of these factors, not the factors include containment measures, for example, lack of transport and ability to move, especially the persons with the disabilities, the persons who need palliative care from one cause or the other, they are in their homes. Movement is a problem. Overload of the health services with the demand for acute care for COVID patients. We, we definitely have been having limitation of bed space and uh, now COVID of course exerts more. In this country we have been lucky, we have not had so many cases, but if too bad in an unlikely event that we got a lot of uh, cases, then this demand for health services would be an overload. And of course, the fear of using services by the population. Sometimes they would say, we shall not go to. 
to the health facilities because we may contract the pandemic. And the health workers themselves sometimes uh, can develop that fear, especially when they lack personal protective equipment. And I think even last night it was in the news with some of the health facilities, although the government has tried to endeavor that as much PPs are provided. And reduction in services in the number of our health providers, because if some of them fail sick, we have been lucky, we have not had so many in this country, but in some countries where so many health workers have been affected, this causes a challenge. So we must really find ways of, uh, of mitigating that. And uh, I want to, some of the recommendations that our guidelines have given in this country to mitigate the impact of COVID-2020 and sustain essential health services uh, in regard to care for persons with disabilities and palliative care is strengthen governance and coordination. Uh, and this should be at national level and subnational level. We are at the national level, our regional hospitals are doing a good job, but even at the district, there are district task forces. And these are multi-sector. We have uh, the politicians, we have security, and the health workers, of course, are the frontline soldiers uh, in provision of these services and guidance. But we also need to define high priority essential services for people who need, for persons with disabilities and people who need palliative care. And adjust accordingly. We cannot continue doing business as usual. Otherwise, as I've already told you, the barrier includes, uh, they may hinder uh, these people from accessing the services. And we must define the immediate actions and implement them towards these services. Monitoring is very essential. And I think we need to build a lot of collaborations with both government and non-government organizations to monitor. Otherwise, we may eventually find that these disadvantaged or marginalized people during the COVID continue to be marginalized further. And that is very dangerous uh, during COVID and post-COVID. And I've already said that it is, it is at national level in this country, regional level, the district and the health facility. Uh, some of the general con considerations and alignment to COVID-19 control, I've talked about the barriers, but when, depending on underlying health conditions, people with disability, I've already said, will be at a greater risk of developing more severe cases of the COVID-19 if they are infected. And this can be because of the exacerbating existing health conditions, especially where there is comorbidity. Take for instance, the affected immune system, heart conditions and other diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. But barriers to accessing health care, these are the people who already have limitations of, or restrictions in activity. So if we don't work on accessibility, like I had already elaborated above, that is an issue. So people with a disability may be disproportionately impacted by this pandemic because of the dis dis serious disruptions. Uh, some of the actions uh, for people with disability in their house and their households is that we need to reduce the potential exposure to COVID. And everyone with a disability in the household should follow the guidelines set by WHO and our Minister of Health. Those having any difficulty following best protection measures, for example, uh, not able to uh, access hand basins or sink because we promote hand washing uh, regularly, should need to be assisted by the family members and friends and caregivers. Otherwise, they will miss out. But they also, we need to help avoid overcrowding environments for these type of populations. And we need to consider uh, unnecessary visits, uh, especially in, in risky places. We need to take advantage of special opening hours for our health units uh, for the people who may go there to seek uh, rehab our services. And we need to ensure in this time and thereafter that assistive devices, if used, are disinfected frequently. 
for a, 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 a non-disabled person, you only need to wash your hands and put a mask and observe social distance and, and like that. But if you are using a white cane, if you are using any other assistive device, then you see you need to continue also disinfecting that. And these include wheelchairs, white canes, and, uh, all, uh, and, and all the other devices we are talking about. Uh, which are handled in public by these disabled persons. But we also need to look at the area of health information, public awareness is concerned, and uh, sign language needs to be actually used wherever in the social media, wherever there are press briefings. I'm glad that in this country, Uganda, uh, all the news will have sign language, and even any other messages, we have interpreted them, and we have video clips that also talk about the 35 guidelines as given by the head of state since the pandemic started. But we also need to convert these materials into easily read formats for some of these people with the disabilities. And uh, this can include large print for low vision, braille for the blind, and formats for people with, who are deaf blind, a comorbidity and multiple, uh, multiple disabilities. We need to include captions for images used with documents on social media that are inclusive but do not stigmatize disability. We need to work with the disability organizations, including advocacy bodies. And I think the Palliative Association of Uganda uh, is doing a good job to have invited me and I, they have invited other people before. And the disability service providers to disseminate public health information, especially in this area of COVID, uh, but even thereafter. Uh, we need to make sure that we make our services accessible, as I've already said, but also affordable and inclusive. For our guidelines, both the WHO and the national, and work to ensure all clinics providing testing services for COVID are completely accessible to these people. The physical barriers I have already talked about need to be worked on. I'm glad that in this country, we have uh, uh, laws that make sure that any single building that is coming up, be it public or private, should actually take care of accessibility. If you visit some of the towers in Kampala now, the lifts have started also being compatible whereby even the person who is blind and the sound will help you and he or she knows that you have reached this floor. And any information on health during this COVID and thereafter needs to be disseminated to these people who are marginalized as we have been talking about. Uh, certain populations like I've been talking about, people who need palliative care, persons with disabilities, uh, like it to be more significantly affected, like I have said, by COVID, because of this comorbidity, this, the science has proved that. We need to ensure that these people have access to continuous access to services. We do not need to stop, and including public health information. Uh, these circumstances are a basis for these, uh, uh, the COVID-19 response plans. Uh, we have already talked about the barriers that need to be worked on. And uh, there is the need, for example, by some of these people to touch things, to obtain information from the environment, that these, these persons with disabilities, we need to make sure that we actually uh, uh, work on reduction of the transmission. Again, in the Ugandan scenario, I'm heading towards the end of my presentation. Uganda strives towards progressive improvement of palliative care and uh, rehab services for persons with disabilities. And some of the following recommendations are likely to make a difference in transforming legal and policy commitments into measures of equity. Policy commitments are very vital, ladies and gentlemen. Community advocacy so that eventually we change society attitudes and work on negative attitudes, both by the families, the community, but including some of the providers, including healthcare workers. We need to train, train, 
we have palliative healthcare workers, palliative care providers to meet this ever increasing demand for those services. Provision of accessible information and assistive devices. An assistive device is very important for a person with a disability. But we need to commit and earmark more disability funds, more funds for palliative care, both by government and other stakeholders. Data is very important. Data on palliative care and disability is not, has not been very easily available. But I'm glad to say that they recently uh, concluded and launched and now being used health management information system of the ministry took care of a lot of disability indicators and palliative care. And these are going to be more informative, but we need to analyze it uh, and then mainstream it in other programs. As analyzed as possible, that is very important so that we get data to help us with advocacy and adequate planning. Some of the challenges that Uganda's disability journey has looked at we need to know that despite Uganda's achievements in disability, uh, and it is the same with palliative care, there are several challenges. I've talked about the statistics and the, the data HMS would be important. But I think even in subsequent censuses, we need to do better. Uh, this lack of data, I need to say, especially at all levels, compounds the difficulties in planning and the targeting for services. There is need to revolutionize disability related data to attain consistent and reliable statistics to help us. And Sante Sana, Mwewari Munonga, Mwewari Nyo, Apoyo Matek, Wanya Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Commissioner, for that presentation. Uh, very realistic and covering a whole range of issues. Uh, we are going to shortly invite uh, comments, questions, and any further input from the participants. But before we do that, I'm just going to invite Priscilla, uh, Priscilla Ondonga, to just say some additional remarks uh, on the same topic, on the same issue. Priscilla, you are welcome. Hello. Hello. Yes, thank you. I'm Priscilla. I'm a physiotherapist and I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm excited about uh, what I've heard, particularly about involvement of rehabilitation workers because there's a range of us who are involved in uh, caring for persons with disability. And um, with the COVID coming into the picture of uh, illnesses and disabilities existing, there were a lot of challenges that we thought about as physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, Many of the challenges were about, were about our ability to continue to see our patients. And amongst these patients, the ones that really took center stage were persons with physical disability, persons that are visually impaired, those that are hard of hearing, the intellectually challenged, inclusive of autism, and the elderly. So we thought uh, this really impacted on how where we are going to render our services to them. And in, in concluding, especially in Africa, it, it was very difficult, it still was difficult because we thought uh, maybe we could use uh, telehealth through telephones, through you know Zoom, name it, but that became a challenge because of accessibility. Uh, what we have uh, gone ahead to do in the various countries because as uh, rehabilitation workers in Africa, we've come together as a group and we've uh, developed guidelines on providing a service, especially during the COVID era. And um, we do have a specific sector that talks about persons with disabilities and various impairments. 
And in this way, we've talked about uh, especially the information sharing, because we said before we go to transportation on getting to them, having ourselves get the PPE in order to be able to handle them in case they get COVID, which luckily we've had only mild cases here. Yeah, we thought the information being shared is, uh, is uh, probably discriminatory and they're not able to get this information or to, to properly appreciate what is being shared. And so we've, uh, in our various settings, developed uh, information that we are sharing with the different small groups that we're having in our countries and communities and in our local languages to be able to help these persons even during COVID. We've had to be able to buy ourselves PPE if we want to continue to work with the patients. And I'm glad that the good doctor has talked about uh, rehabilitation workers actually being catered for in the new structure, and we are looking forward to that. The biggest challenge which he has spoken about is information, data, 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 research. Because without the data, it's going to be very difficult for us to establish, it's going to be difficult for us to design any programs. And this data is very scanty for countries, especially in Africa and Uganda. And so, I think it's important that in whatever way that we're able to, we get to these patients, I call them patients or clients that we are dealing with who have got any kind of disability and actually get this information from them. How would they want to be helped? What do they feel is the most difficult thing? Because when we talk about, for example, hand washing, look at a person who has got to, you know, get themselves along the way by crawling on the ground. Maybe they have got to go and mend shoes somewhere. He's going to ask you, how many times would I be able to wash my hands if I'm going to be moving, you know, up and down, you see? So are there measures that we can actually do for you? So then they're suggesting things like, okay, maybe I can have a jerry can that I can, you know, attach onto my wheelchair if I have one. And so that when I get to place of work, that's what I use. And then messing the area up where I'm working so I think research is really very important. And that's one thing that came out when we asked ourselves and our clients these questions. When it came to, you know, the, like the audio messages, the messages on TV. So you're asking your clients, imagine a person who is deaf blind. There's, there's, there's really no braille for you to be able to, to explain to them Okay, and we're grateful for our colleagues, the occupational therapists. They're very good at, you know, finding ways of, of helping these people around. And so I think, to say for the rehabilitation workers, I think research would be a very, very important bit for us. And involvement in uh, national issues. Like in Uganda, there's really no rehabilitation worker anywhere up there. We have managed to get ourselves uh, under the mental pill of the National Task Force to be able to participate, to be able to contribute, to be able to help in involvement and taking care of persons with disabilities in this COVID era. They definitely do have a very big challenge. Increasing on what was already existing for them with the disabilities, and also the risk, the increased risk of them worsening because COVID is here, they're not able to get their services. Then also the increased risk of them catching the disease if they're exposed to it. So we'd be very grateful if we can get uh, opportunity to carry out research or to share whatever data we have with the, the ministry and um, to sum it up also, funds and facilitation seems to be a very big uh, challenge to particularly research and publishing research. And many times, if we are carrying out research and we are publishing, it's going to be easier for us to find the facilitation and funding to be able to 
implement what you have found and to also be able to continue to carry out research. Like I said, we have developed a document, a guideline for rehab workers in Africa, and would be happy to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks, uh, Priscilla. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Bubikira, you would like to say something before, uh, just uh, based on the issues, some of the pertinent issues she has raised before we open it to everyone to ask their questions or to make their contributions. Very little remark. I am glad that we are agreeing on the need for improvement in our research agenda and data management. And she has emphasized that the way I emphasized it and added on more value. And I thank her for appreciating the fact that our new structure has taken care of uh, therapists at very high level. And, uh, and I think this has been missing for the last so many years, but this one has been overcome. And I will be looking forward, uh, of course, to her sharing with us uh, the, the material that has been developed for the African context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just open it now uh, to anyone who would like to uh, ask either of the presenters, uh, our main presenter, Dr. Bobikire, or to or something that uh, the remarks that Priscilla has made. Anyone who would like to comment or to give additional remarks? Um, you should be able to put your hand up and uh, our host will allow you to speak. I can just in the meantime... Uh, so can you hear me? The, uh, okay, Mark, we were not hearing you, but now we can hear you. Uh, so thank you so much and thank you so much, Dr. Wichire for a very enlightening uh, uh, presentation. Um, I'm calling from Pikau, the Palliative Care Association of Uganda, and this is Mark. And we have worked with a team uh, from Dr. Wichire's office and very closely with the, the clinical services department. We have been working with the deaf uh, community in Uganda and their challenge, of course, is communication uh, throughout whenever they want to get services. and. I think at some point there's an NGO that um, supported them to go to court to take the Minister of Health uh, because of sign language. Um, but their, their request is, is, is about sign language and their language can easily be, be learned, especially the basic signs that at least each healthcare worker can, can get. And maybe um, learning more about that, we will reach out to Dr. Wichile for, for where we have uh, come from and where we have reached about that. I agree with him about the information sharing, especially in the era of, of COVID, and the information that should not necessarily be stigmatizing of community or of people with, who are with disabilities. And when he was emphasizing that point, he mentioned that two districts, that is Shema and Mukono, had come up with um, uh, good practices that can be replicated. I, I hope maybe he can shed more light on how uh, his uh, uh, department at the ministry can help in ensuring that these best practices are replicated elsewhere because indeed the aging uh, or the aged in Uganda have, uh, they find a lot of challenges, not only uh, that that concern disability, but even in all other aspects. And I believe if there are bylaws, maybe they will be like enriched and they will be very good to, for people to, to, 
to listen to and to, to copy. And I think the issue the, of data has been emphasized. It's very, very important that we get data even for palliative care services. And he spoke about the HMIS. And I only add that this data should be, uh, should be analyzed and shared uh, according to the platforms that we can all access as a country and that it can be useful to us. I think uh, those are my comments and I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to join and to listen to him speak and for all the enlightenment that we got in this call. Thank you so much, Dr. Wichi. Thank you. I think he had, one, he had a question amidst the comments. Thanks for the comments, Mark. Um, but maybe you can respond to the one or so questions that he asked. Yeah, thank you, uh, Prisa. Uh, the question is how the best practices in regard to health aging as seen in Shema and the Mokona districts can be rolled out to other countries, uh, districts in Uganda. We have already embarked on that. One, we have used the information and experiences there to inform the development of uh, this, our strategic plan and policy guidelines on health aging, which we are developing, uh, guided and uh, by World Health Organization, country office and regional office. So we have an advanced draft and we have worked with the people from Shema, uh, especially the district chairperson himself, who has been active in our meetings, and then the Mukono Technical Group. And uh, so once we have all those in the guidelines, and the guidelines are disseminated and implemented, then that is one way of rolling out. But the other way is when we go out for uh, at least some of the districts in our advocacy engagements, we use those experiences from the two districts to engage the local leaderships in the districts to use the same, uh, to adopt the same. Because under a decentralized system of government, for us, as I said in our mandate, it is at policy formulation, standards and guidelines, but implementation lies at, down there. And where the district leadership, like in those two districts, have taken the lead, things are moving. I want to say, I quoted the two districts, but I should say the others have moved far. They have not yet passed the bylaws, but uh, I think they have moved far, including Hoima, including Guru, including Lira. Uh, so I think we are really in the correct step. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, I'm just going to read a question that has come from Lacey in the chat. Uh, if you can prioritize, I think this comes to you and also maybe Priscilla, if you can uh, consider that as well. If you can prioritize one thing that must happen immediately for people with disabilities during this pandemic concerning COVID-19, what is it? If you can prioritize one thing that's critical for people with disabilities during this pandemic concerning COVID-19, what is it and how can we act on it? This is a question from Lacey, our colleague from Globe Partners. Thank you. Very difficult uh, choice to select only one because I, I don't know where to start. But uh, I think uh, we need, it is very difficult to point out one, but I think uh, my colleagues have already talked about the issue of data. Our HMIS is carrying out correcting data routinely. It is corrected in a raw material. We have limited capacity to analyze it further. I think we need to first deal with that data. We identify the gaps or, or the information it is already bringing in before we even, then that will be able to give us the gaps, the strength, and then inform us in our advocacy, and then uh, what also we need to do in the area of further research, which may not necessarily be from routine. But I'm not saying that that is the most, and uh, I, I would not do that alone. I would still insist that we must engage uh, our service providers, the rehab uh, health workers, and the uh, caregivers for palliative care give them skills, skills development, what we call in-service uh, training. 
These are short courses of a few days, a few weeks, so that we make them ready. Because as I pointed out, one of the issues was they can fear. And they are right fear. So and we don't want them to ignore the people who need the services. So I think immediate skills development through some short in-service training is very, very essential. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dubukiri. Uh, Priscilla, do you want to say something if you were to prioritize just one area? Just one thing, which is difficult, like the good doctor has said. I wish that hmm. said 10, then we would be, you know, firing them off. But uh, in addition to what he says, or to emphasize on the doctor's point, I think it would be to build the competence of the direct and immediate caretakers in actually looking after the persons with disabilities. Because these are a very important group in the lives of persons with disabilities. And many times, they're not equipped. One, they're not equipped mentally on how to look after these people because it gets a little too much. I think that would be what I would do to take the immediate caretakers and equip them to look after our persons with disabilities during COVID. Sound has gone. Let me see. Was Rai, you are muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mm. <laughs> so I'm just saying, um, Lacey just sent an acknowledgement that I know it is a difficult question, but I ask because of so many challenges. If we can begin with one and then we move forward slowly. Because she says even in the US, um, caregivers of those with disabilities are struggling during lockdown. Rapid short trainings are a great idea. I agree with the data issue, also important. And thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. OK, um, there's also another comment from Mark here that says the issue of information sharing is key. I think it's great that we've learned from the experiences of a couple of districts here. That's also quite important. A lot of the responses can, can actually be uh, replicated or uh, applied to different settings as well. So thank you, Mark, for that comment. OK, we are coming towards the end of our time. I don't know if anyone else still wants to say something. You can still put your hand up. We have just a couple of minutes left. Otherwise, uh, while we wait, if anyone wants to put their hand up, uh, I want to say thank you very much to our presenter, uh, Dr. Bubikire. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the insights that you've given and some of the experiences you've shared from Uganda. I think we can pick something from there, from uh, the different uh, nations that are represented uh, that we can take forward. And thank you to Priscilla for your remarks as well from a practitioner's point of view also. Uh, thank you very much. Before we close, there's just one more comment that I can um, that I can uh, that I'm going to read, and it's coming from Sergio Damaso, and he's saying our experience in London is that many relatives without previous experience in caring started to care during this stage. It brings us back to the concept of compassionate communities empowered to care. Mo many of us professionals were less needed during this time. Uh, so a lot of family members had to actually, uh, professionals were less needed during this time and just followed up at a distance. So family members had to take up the responsibility and found themselves having to do the care roles. I think that also, it's an experience in London, but also it has happened here because the care workers could not travel, could not move up and down. So it's across many different societies. Um, so on behalf of the African Palliative Care Association, I would like uh, to just say thank you very much to all our participants as well. I thank the presenters. Uh, and uh, we are going to have another presentation which is going to talk about engaging communities uh, and it's coming up in the next two weeks. We'll be sending out um, 
the invitation. Thank you to the Palliative Care Association of Uganda for your insights as well. Thank you, everyone. We wish you a good day. Thank you.